to this video today we talk about delhi sultans class 7 history chapter 3 ncert pattern class 7 history chapter 3 ncert pattern delhi sultans now when we started to have large kingdoms kingdoms ruled out of delhi keeping delhi as a capital those were mostly mostly sultans so we call that as a delhi sultanate so this happened sometimes around 12th 13th century now the areas around delhi were not very important places of administration or commerce or anything before though the indo gangetic plain was very fertile delhi itself was not one very important place for a long time it was just a garrison and then there were a class of warriors called rajputs and they were working for chauhan of ajmer also for some time and these rajputs were fearful fighters somewhat we can say the equivalent of the good old knights of the crusade spirit then some jain merchants started settling in around around delhi and because merchants were settled there trade flourished and people started to have more prosperity later the delival coins were also minted out of delhi so that is another reason or another aspect of the prominence of delhi in the overall scheme of things in india so because of the traders because of the prosperity because of the need for money exchange or the delival coins and other things helping economic activity in that region it became a cultural center also subsequently so first it became an economic center then a cultural center but earlier to that it was just a garrison what is a garrison a town that houses soldiers and has things which are related to the armor army or their requirements so later in 13th century the delhi sultanate got established and delhi started to become called as a capital delhi started controlling larger areas why when delhi started controlling larger areas not only it was becoming popular as an administrative region it was also becoming popular because many small towns and forts were built in and around delhi and so delhi expanded from being a capital town it expanded to become what we call as a city the sultans seldom controlled the whole of india from delhi when we say the whole of india what we mean is the delhi sultanate never ruled the country called india today not even the subcontinent not even the peninsular india delhi sultans were having control over many kingdoms that were there in india but then the kingdoms in the hinterland were many times not really under the control of delhi because the communications were poor the type of administrative capabilities were poor and so delhi was not really able to control the hinterlands what are hinterlands the hinterlands are the places on the extremities far away towns and to run such a big empire delhi needed a lot of money delhi as a capital delhi as a sultanate and that money could come only from plundering other kings or run waging a war against others or plundering other temples or plundering the palaces of other kingdom so this is the only way they could make money because delhi sultanate by itself did not have a lot of money to run such a large kingdom now to generally look at the time map the pala empire was there in and around delhi from 1130 to 1145 and then the chauhans were ruling the area around delhi from 1165 to 1192 for around 30 40 years so each of this was only some 15 years or 30 years then there were turkish rulers the people who came from turkey and were able to capture the administration at delhi are the turkish rulers they were there for almost 90 years and then the khaljis the khilji and the khaljis they were there for another 30 years and then the tughlaqs ruled tughlaqs ruled for almost 100 years and then the sayyids ruled sayyids ruled for around 40 years and then the lodhis ruled for around 75 years so the palas were having the control over delhi first and then the chauhans and then the turkish rulers the khaljis the tughlaqs and sayyids and then very few dynasties had over more than 100 year control of those regions that is how delhi was handed over to different rulers to different dynasties to different kings during various periods that is why we don't have something called a kingdom ruled by delhi for a long period in those days we are talking about the history around 12th century the medieval history now history was chronicled in those days why because we have seen in medieval history in later stages not in 700s and 800s but when it is 1100 1300 1300 people started recording there was paper 
there was no need to wash the manuscripts people were able to create more paper and write the paper was having more life the people who are able to write were more literacy was there scribes were there who were willing to copy and keep the records yes there were mistakes so some scribes used to add a word here or a sentence there but still different handwritings were there we have seen that if cursive versus dialect we are not able to read now but still there were records from the various records we are able to find out what happened in those periods now one of the way in which we got the record is tarikh or tawarikh tarikh or tawarikh is something that is written in persian a chronicle or a history or a journal written in persian is called tarikh or tawarikh today we use the word tarikh to mean address also in the today's uh, uh, urdu based hindi tarikh could mean an address earlier tarikh meant something more than that not just the address but the contents inside also tarikh or tawarikh the people who write this are called tawarikh who were these people in general we can call as scribes but they were the secretaries the administrators the poets the courtiers the learned people of those days who were able to record and recount the past or record the present or make a note of what was happening and what is happening based on the things that happened around the king that is advice that was given to the king the orders that were issued by the king how the administration and the governance of the kingdom happened those were the material or matter that were recorded by the secretaries and administrators so the position of the land order how justice was ensured and things like that how revenue was collected and things like that so the manuscripting consists of paper preparation writing highlighting with gold for important things and binding those manuscripts so the writing the manuscripts were not just on palm leaves but also on paper and there was a big process so people knew how to manage paper how to ensure paper doesn't get destroyed how to ensure certain alphabets are highlighted or words are highlighted for importance and how to keep them bound together all those know how was there in those period to these tawariks then there were coins introduced by the delhi sultanate delhi sultanate is also known for the architecture delhi sultanate kings were known for the inscriptions that they ensured were made in stones and pillars around the kingdom now there was a person called fakir e mudabir the fakir e mudabir wrote about the circle of justice fakir e mudabir's circle of justice is something that you should remember because he said the king needs soldiers to ensure the kingdom is well run and what do the soldiers need the soldiers need to be paid and the soldiers should get their payment they want the peasants to grow agriculture crops well peasants has to be prosperous so that they will pay their taxes so that the king will get money also you need the traders who will pay the taxes and ensure that whatever the peasants are making are sold to the market and users so that the king gets his tax so this circle of justice written by fakir e mudabir is called the important aspect in those days because the king depends on soldiers soldier depends on income income is coming from the peasants and traders who are able to produce and sell and pay taxes so that the king gets his money to pay the salary so this is the cycle right cycle of responsibilities of the people to each other so everybody understood it is an ecosystem everybody understood that they have to be interdependent they cannot independently work and everybody needs everybody's help to ensure there is peace in the kingdom now these people who wrote about the history also valued the importance of inheritance inheritance or hereditary powers or hereditary rights they also valued gender distinctions and superiority what does it mean these people who were recording the history the tawariks the way they wrote says that they were having preferences for certain people who are born to certain people so the son of a king is more important than anybody else irrespective of the capabilities of the person so inheritance was more important than the merit likewise men were considered superior to women so these type of beliefs or principles were there in the minds of the writers in those days now these views were not necessarily all inclusive or comprehensive means what the writers or the people who recorded the history wrote what they felt is right from their perspective it does not mean the whole society believed that so their stories were not all inclusive their stories were not comprehensive their stories were only their version of their understanding of their belief of what the way things are happening around them okay 
Now, how do we know that they had preferences for men or they did not, uh, they respected hereditary than in the hereditary rights or inheritance than anything else? Now, there was a sultan called Ithumish. Now, Ithumish had a daughter called Rasiya. So, Rasiya became sultana. So, Rasiya sultana, you would have heard a very famous personality in Indian history. She became the king in 1236. But though Menaji Siraj, we have heard about Menaji Siraj in the previous classes also. Minaji Siraj recognized that she was more able and more capable and more qualified than all her brothers to be the king or the sultana. She was ousted by the nobles mostly because they felt women were subordinate to men. Women were not supposed to rule and they felt they cannot be subordinates to a woman. They felt they cannot be taking instructions or orders from a woman. They felt the kingdom should not be ruled by a lady and so Including Minaji Siraj, who recognized Sultana's capabilities, Rasiya Sultana was not allowed to be the ruler at Delhi for more than four years. Within four years of she becoming the Sultana, she was ousted and somebody else was placed as a puppet over there. So, this record shows that people had preferences for sons and daughters of the king only, but at the same time, the daughter does not have or the lady does not have a right to rule over men. So, this is one thing that we understand from the mindset of the people of those who recorded history at that time. But is this very, very true? May or may not be because other version has not been recorded. We don't know. During similar period, for example, in 1236 when Razia became Sultana, there was a lady called Rudrama Devi in Kakatiya dynasty in Warangal, where in the northern Andhra Pradesh we can say. So, in Warangal Kakatiya dynasty, there was a lady called Rudrama Devi. She changed her name on her inscriptions. She pretended she was a man. She dressed like a man. She went and fought wars like a man. In all public experience, ex um, what do you call, uh, public exposures or public meetings or wherever she was coming in public, she was acting or conducting herself as a man. She was actually an adopted daughter of the king, they say, and because the king did not have a son, he adopted. And when he adopted, he adopted a lady and brought up. And that lady, when she was ready to become a prince or a king, people will not agree a lady to become a successor. So she acted as a man and she ruled well. She helped the father rule well. But she could not tell the public that she is a lady and she is a princess and she is a queen. She had to present herself as if she is a man or a king so that she can continue the good work she is doing. That also happened at the same time. Why she was compelled to do this? Because the society felt a lady cannot be a ruler or society felt uh, the ladies are not supposed to be inferior, not superior to men or the society felt they don't want to be ruled by a queen but they wanted a king in the dynasty. So this happened almost at the similar time. In 1236, Rasha Sultana was ruling and Rudrama Devi lived between 1262 and 1289. So, this is what happened. Like this, there are many examples where though girls were capable of being the princess and the queen, they were not allowed to and they had to fight a lot. Now, what is the reach of the Delhi's powers or Delhi's administrative capabilities or governance controls? Now, Delhi was originally meant as a controlling garrison town, but they couldn't control the distant Bengal and Sindh. These garrison towns of Delhi, they couldn't control themselves. But then the soldier in the garrison town of Delhi or the rulers sitting in Delhi were not able to control the different garrisons of Bengal or Sindh. And so what happened? The soldiers there started acting on their own at times and they were going beyond the control of the Delhi Sultanate. Also, in far off small kingdoms, places far away from Delhi, if there is a rebellion or people get into a war or even if there is a calamity because of weather, Delhi never came to know of occurrences of such events because communication was no good and they were far away. Now, there were Mongol invasions happening from Afghanistan. When they came from Afghanistan, Delhi was not able to withstand those invasions. The real consolidation of the Sultanate happened only during Balban's time, we can say. The real consolidation happened only during Giyasuddin Balban's time, we can say. Giyasuddin Balban was in 1266-1287 period. Further expansion happened under Alauddin Kilji. So, when Rasiya Sultana was there as a Delhi Sultanate, at the Delhi Sultanate, Sultana was ruling a smaller Delhi. Then the consolidation happened because we know 
Russia was ruling sometime around 1236 and then Balban consolidated sometime around 1266 after that Alauddin Khilji was ruling so Alauddin Khilji 1296 to 1316 he was there for around 20 years and he expanded the Delhi Sultanate and he consolidated and it is at that point in time we can say the Delhi Sultanate was really becoming a big kingdom something worth to be called as a sultanate something worth to be called as a empire ruled by a maharaja it was becoming so big only during khalji's time started during balban's time and then during tughlaq's time it really became paran why that is 12, 1324 to 1351 so when when it all started we know the para dynasty chauhar dynasty turkish ruler so itmish was a turkish ruler and russia was a daughter of that turkish ruler then the alauddin khalji came here then the Tughlaq came Balban and Tughlaq came from this period So Balban 1266 to 1287 he did the consolidation expansion was done by Alauddin Khilji 1296 to 1316 and then Muhammad Tughlaq really became the ruler of a wider and a larger Delhi Sultanate As a part of consolidation what they did first the hinterlands were captured what is the hinterland the area lying on the outskirts the suburbs the outer places forests were cleared the ganga yamuna basin was cleared and then hunter gatherers and past relatives were driven away and people were asked to do agriculture over there that means the land was given to peasants asking them to do agriculture why the more agriculture you have in the ganges basin the more producers will be there the traders could sell more so the peasants and traders could pay more taxes this is one way of increasing the revenue of the kingdom so consolidation means during at, um, at the hinterland the forests were cleared hunter gatherers and pastoralists were expelled what is pastoralist the people who live on making money out of the pasture that means what grazing the grazing grounds the shepherds and the cowherds etc so they were expelled and then peasants were encouraged to do agriculture this is what one way of consolidation that they did to begin with then they built new fortresses why you need fortresses when you become a little bit richer when you have revenue other people will wage war on you so you need to have fortress to defend garrison towns were built garrison towns were the places where it was full full of soldiers and armies and armaments and ammunition and then other towns were established for people to settle for traders to do trade and then trade routes were laid trade routes means what export and import between multiple kingdoms and countries were made possible so indo ganges plain if they make only sugar cane and rice or wheat then this will be sold to others who make other things and then bring about so trade routes for corridors were installed saying these things will go from this town to this town during this season that is what we call as a trade route subsequently after this consolidation of the hinterlands and expansion military expeditions were made military expeditions were made to annex other kingdom so that is the one way in which your kingdom will expand one is consolidation one is expansion so when you want to expand you do a military expedition to other kingdoms fight them or subdue them or threaten them and make them your subordinate so expeditions were done to southern india also the southern parts of india the kerala tamil nadu karnataka andhra of today in good old days were not really part of the delhi sultanate so expeditions were done and then what they captured they captured the horses and the elephants and slaves and money and things like that precious metals gold like silver was also taken away but because these places were so far from delhi sultanate subsequently when they went back these people declared their freedom again so the delhi sultanate was not really able to control or keep the whole of india under their control now we have seen the reach of the delhi sultanate what is another specialty they built a lot of mosques now we can see the turkish rulers the khaljis the tughlaqs or were all believers of islam that means what islam came to india only after 700 800 from the persian iran and other travelers or the traders who came into india through afghanistan or through the sea so when people when the rule was by the people who believe or the by the muslims the people who believe in islam when other smaller places had traditional uh, hindu kings or others and christianity had not yet spread in india what these devout muslim rulers did is build a lot of mosques so mosque were a place where people congregated it was a place where all the muslims came together so culturally also it was an important place not just for religion what is a mosque mosque or masjid is the place where people pray muslims prostrate in reverence of allah peace be upon him 
on a way that has been taught by Prophet Muhammad and for this the rulers of the Delhi Sultanate built a lot of mosques. Begampuri mosque was very important. It was built by Muhammad Tughlaq. Then there was a mosque of Jahanapa, the sanctuary of the world it was called in capital Delhi. Even today, the Juma Masjid in Delhi is larger than many other mosques in many other parts of the world, the Juma Masjid of Delhi. So, this Masjid is called Juma Masjid when people congregate for Juma, for a larger prayer, when not just hundreds but more people come to that mosque and when there is so much space and when it is so large, it will be called a Juma Masjid for congregational prayer. Congregational prayer, congregational prayer. So mostly the Friday afternoon prayers are considered to be a Juma prayer or a bigger prayer than other prayers. So all the people from all over places used to congregationally pray. Means come together as one and together pray together. So that is the way it is. The reading of the prayer is called Namas. And for these mosques, many facilities or you know, conveniences were made available by the rulers. The most respected person will be chosen as a leader called Imam for leading the rituals. Now he will be standing in front of them and helping them to proceed with their prayer formalities. The Imam will also deliver a sermon, it is called Kutbah, during the Friday prayer. He will tell what is happening, how the way people should live, what they should prepare for, what should be their ideals in life, what should be the goals and things like that. Muslims stand facing Makkah during the prayers, it is called Qibla. From India, Makkah is on the west, left hand side. So, belongingness, a sense of community of believers who shared a belief system and a code of conduct is called belongingness. Belongingness is a sense of community feeling, sense of brotherhood of all the believers who share a common belief system and a common code of conduct. This belongingness will be built when people go for congregational prayers in the mosque, when they be together, when they are led by their uh, loving leader, the Imam, when good ideals are given to them during the Qutbah prayers. So, to facilitate all this, many mosques were built by the Delhi Sultanate so that people can meet their need for religious and cultural satisfaction. How was the administration in those days? Delhi Sultanate needed reliable governors because they were expanding and consolidating and other kingdoms were coming under their control. But then they were not able to find good dependable persons. So, what they did? Instead of appointing aristocrats and landed chieftains, earlier we have seen many landlords and um, uh, warrior generals or the army generals were appointed as controllers of various regions. But here what they did, instead of appointing aristocrats and landed chieftains as governors, the sultans favored their special slaves who were purchased for the military service. The sultans who came from Persia and Iran earlier, they had brought a lot of slaves with them who were purchased for military service. Now such purchased sultans the purchased slaves of the sultans were more dependable, more reliable for the sultans than the aristocrats and the landed chieftains. They were trained to man some of the most important political offices. So, worthy and experienced slave is better than a son. That is what they said. That is what they believed. That is what is recorded. A worthy and experienced slave is better than a son. So, the slaves were trained to man the important officers, political officers and to be governors. Right? So, they were considered reliable the slaves were obedient, the slaves were trustworthy. That is why instead of appointing aristocrats, the sultans appointed reliable, obedient, trustworthy, experienced, trained slaves as governors to various regions. Now, they were loyal to their masters and patrons, but not to their heirs. Now, a slave will be loyal to his master, quite natural. But the slave need not be loyal to others. And when we say others, even if it is a son and daughter of the master, the slaves may not be may not be having loyalty to the same extreme to what they used to have with the actual original master. And then when the new monarchs ascended the throne during the dynasty of father dies and the son or a daughter like the Sultan, when somebody next comes into the throne, they will have their own slaves. They will appoint their own people as governors of or controlling authorities of various offices. And now there was a clash between the old and new nobility, the old slaves and the new slaves, the slaves appointed by the earlier sultan and the slaves appointed by the newer sultan. So, this also created some sort of friction. Now, there was a chronicler, Siyauddin Baroni. What is a chronicler? Person who records the happenings of the present or recounts and recalls what happened in the past as was told to him by the people from whom he tried to learn history and recorded. He is a chronicler. 
See, the Barani recorded that Sultan's incapacity to rule. Sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq appointed Asis Kamar a wine distiller, Firuz Hajam a barber, Manka Tabak a cook, and Ladan Pira the gardeners as administrative position or administrative power. Siyadwan Barani, with 14th century chronicler, reported that Muhammad bin Tughlaq was in, not capable to rule as a sultan. Why? Because he appointed Asis Kamar a wine distiller, Firuz Hajam a barber, Manka Tabak a cook, and two governors, Lada and Pira, to high administrative posts. Now, is it wrong? It may not be wrong because they believe experienced slave, a trained slave is better than a son because a slave was reliable, obedient and trustworthy and because they were loyal to the core and they will die for you. But then, Zerahuddin Baroni felt actually people who are capable like other aristocrats and chieftains should have been appointed as governors of various offices instead of appointing a barber or a wine distiller or a cook. Now, there were people who were military commanders, the muktis. They were also appointed as governors of certain territories that is called Ikta. So, military commanders were called Mukti and the territories that were given to them to control was called Ikta. What they were supposed to do? They were supposed to maintain a large army. They were supposed to encourage people to do agriculture. They were supposed to collect the taxes from the peasants. Using that money, they were supposed to manage this army that is paying salary and take care of the army. And they were supposed to give a certain portion to the king. And in case of a war, they were supposed to come along with that army and fight for the king. These were the expectations of the Sultan when they appointed a Mukti and gave him some Ikta. The military commanders were appointed as governors of certain territories, Ikta and Mukti. Now, whether these uh, people were really helping the peasants to do agriculture and collecting taxes and maintaining an army and paying the soldiers or not, how do you know? For that, the sultans appointed accountants. The accountants traveled around the state and checked the amount of revenue collected, amount paid to the soldiers, how big the army they are maintaining, how good is the army and all. Why? Or else what will happen in case of a war, the sultan will say, okay, come with the army and fight for you and you will find there is neither the army nor the army capable of fighting. So the accountants are appointed to correctly account for what is happening. They also ensured A, there is no revenue leakage and B, there is no excess tax. Revenue leakage means what? The government, the Sultan asked to collect a tax, but you are not collecting and so there is a revenue not coming to the government. Second is what? You are collecting excess and penalizing the peasants and so peasants are having an uprising or dissatisfaction about the Sultan. These two should not happen. For that, the accountants ensured only the taxes prescribed by the state were collected. They also ensured salaries were paid to the soldiers. They also ensured a nominal size of army is maintained at all times. Now, we have in the earlier classes studied about Samantha, Maha Samantha, etc. Who were the equivalent of these muktis or who were the landed zamindars or aristocrats. Now, the Delhi Sultans forced the Samantha aristocrats and the rich landlords to accept their authority. Sultans said, you may be a landlord of your village, but then you will be under my authority. You will do my bidding. That means what? You will pay a portion of the revenue collection to me. You will maintain an army. You will ensure the peasants are kept happy. You will ensure you will not collect more taxes. You will ensure you only rightful taxes are collected. All the rules of the Delhi Sultan, the aristocrats and Samantas were also supposed to follow. Now, some Samantas did not like this. Some revolted, some grouped. All this also happened. That is always possible. When somebody says something, not everybody will accept. Now, what were the taxes that were acceptable on cultivation called Kharaj? amounting to 50% of the peasants produce were collected. That was the tax on cultivation called Kharaj. The amount of about 50% of the produce was collected. Then there was a tax on cattle and a tax on houses. Tax on cattle and tax on houses because these were considered as assets. Okay. The large parts of the subcontinent remained outside the control of Delhi. As we see, if you look at a map, the Delhi Sultanate was only in the central India. The east, the west, the north, the south, everything was outside the control of Delhi. Now, what were the chieftains doing and what their fortifications were? Now, there was a traveler called Ibn Batwa. Just like in this slide, we heard what? We heard about Siyauddin Barauni. We studied about a person. In this slide, we did not read any about any chronicler. Here, 
in in any in, in this lesson we hear about lots of things that have been written by many people menaji siraj is an, another known chronicler fakri ibn abir is a chronicler who wrote about cyclops responsibilities so like that we we get to read or we get to know about things that happen from various recorded historians now one is ibn battuta a traveler what did ibn battuta say he came from morocco morocco in africa what did he say he said the chieftains fortified themselves in mountains or rocky or uneven or rugged places as well as in bamboo groves he said the chieftains the muktis and the land lords fortified themselves in mountains or rocky uneven rugged places and bamboo groves now he wrote also special about the bamboo groves in india ibn battuta from morocco wrote these bamboo groves were very special it is very thick and it cannot be just like that cut and so you need to have skillful machinery and people to cut the bamboo grove so these chiefs cannot be subdued except by powerful and skilled armies and when they say fortified what happened inside the ramparts of the fort inside the fortification they had enough water and food for them for their people for their cattle and they had the crops so ibn battuta recorded that chieftains fortified themselves inside and inside the mountains or rocky and even rugged places and inside the ramparts they had crops and cattle and food and water for their people right and so they cannot be easily subdued this is the record that we get from this chronicler now subsequently we come to know that the sultanate was ruled by different dynasties like that pala chauhan so turkish rulers kali so tughlaq sayyid sultanate is ruled by a sultan subsequently the in delhi sultanate came under the attack of the mongols under jinggis khan he invaded transoxiana it is called transoxiana in those days mongols under jinggis khan invaded so northeast iran northeast iran from the northeast of it, they came in 1219 then mongol attacks on delhi sultanate increased during alauddin khilji period So, because of this, what happened? Alauddin Khilji and Muhammad Tughlaq were compelled to mobilize a large standing army in Delhi because they were sitting in Delhi and ruling. They wanted a large army in Delhi, which can immediately help them to fight the Mongol attacks. And this maintaining a large army to fight this regular attack became a huge administrative challenge. Administrative challenge means what? Difficulty in managing the situation. Now, let us see how each of them did what. what alauddin khilji did during alauddin khilji same delhi was attacked twice one in 1299 and one in 1302 that's within a period of 2 3 years there were two attacks alauddin khilji raised a large army and constructed a new garrison town called sikri siri now siri is somewhere in and around the today's fatehpur sikri we can say okay what he did he collected 50% of the produce as tax from the lands between ganga and yamuna larger region not just a siri he collected the tax from the people on the produce agricultural produce in the ganga yamuna coast plain and this money was used to feed the army that he raised which was stationed at the garrison town siri the soldiers paid were paid salaries in cash rather than iktas that means what soldiers were given salary they were not given land and they were not told okay this is the land now you do whatever you want to do but fight for me they were given salaries soldiers would buy their supplies from merchants in delhi prices were surveyed by the government and the merchants were punished if prices were increased so if merchants were found to increase the price that is in case there is an inflation and soldiers were put to difficulty the agents who surveyed on behalf of the government to ensure the price is stable punish the merchants so by this he ensured prices are stable he ensured soldiers are happy he ensured only money is given to soldier and no other there is no other problem he also ensured that the tax is collected from the people who lived between ganga and yamuna all the peasants will pay only 50% of their produce as tax by this he successfully withstood the threat of mongol invasion he successfully withstood the threat of mongol invasions these were defensive measures and then what happened if somebody did not listen to the rules or if no this 50% is not paid they will forego the land that was the punishment right this is how alauddin khilji had his administration now coming to mohammed bin tughlaq what did he do tughlaq was confident about the strength of the army and its resources and so what did he do he planned to attack transoxiana since they defeated the first attack of mongols 
So once when Mongols attacked, the Sultanate was able to defeat them. So he believed his army is very capable. He has enough resources and Tughlaq wanted to attack them, not just to defend the Delhi Sultanate, but to go and attack them. And then he did one more thing. The oldest of the four cities of Delhi called Delhi Kulna was emptied of its residents and soldiers were garrisoned there. The oldest city or oldest town within the Delhi called Delhi Kunha was emptied and the residents of, were sent out and soldiers were brought in and made as a garrison town. So, in Aladdin Kiriji built a new town, garrison town, city. But Muhammad Tukhlaq, Delhi Kunha was emptied and he made soldiers stay there. The Delhi residents were sent to where? Sent to Daulatabad. Daulatabad was the new capital built in the south, Daulatabad. So, building of a new capital when you wanted money for the wars, emptying people to go to another place and asking the um, soldiers to come and stay in Delhi Kuna were the things Sugluk did because he was confident that he can attack the Mongols instead of defending from them. Then what he did? The produce from the same area was collected as tax to feed the army. The produce from Delhi area only was used to feed the army. So, it might have been possible that the, the taxes collected from Delhi area is not sufficient or because only less taxes collected, less salary was paid to the soldiers here. That is also possible. Now, when it becomes insufficient, when more money is needed for salary, he levied additional taxes. Here, there were no additional taxes. Then, sometimes he paid in cash, sometimes he paid in token currency not gold or silver. He did not pay in gold or silver, which were considered as a mint coin, but he paid in token currency. So, because this token currency is cheap, people started saving their personal wealth in gold and silver and using the cheap token for taxes. The cheap token came back to the government and not to the gold and silver. Because cheap token currency was introduced by the government, the government got back only cheap token currency as taxes and not the gold and silver. This was one small problem that would have come up in that time during the Ugluk's period when they were accounting for the revenue. Now, as a plan of attacking the Mongols, first he tried to attack Kashmir. Kashmir is a hills and valley region. There, Tughlaq's army, the Sultanate's army went there and lost. It was a disaster. The campaign was a disaster. So, he was forced to disband the army. Disbanding the army created more administrative issues because the city was emptied, the garrison town of Delhi Kunha. There were nobody to take care of the armed requirements of the Sultanate in the capital. The soldiers did not have any other work to do because they were not having iktas like the other um, uh, period. So, they were looking for other means of income which they the country or the nation or the kingdom couldn't provide. And then at the same time, there was a famine in the Ganga Yamuna belt. So, this famine, the soldiers leaving the army but not having work, peasants paying more taxes because the soldiers were to be paid, the token currency circulating in the country which is not having value, all this spread to the causes in the minds of the people for a rebellion. This laid the seeds or planted the seeds for a rebellion. Then the currency was recalled, the token currency was recalled by the Mumbai bin Tukluk, the Sultan of Delhi. And he also said, okay, people shift back from Daulatabad to Delhi Kukna. So, this also created further problems because people were troubled. Now, what were the minus points of Tughlaq strategy? If you ask, we can say this was conceived as a military offensive strategy, not a defensive strategy as Alauddin. Right? And then, if somebody did not pay the taxes, they were asked to pay more penalty. Where from will they pay? In Alauddin's time, what will happen is they will have to forego the land. They cannot be peasants farmer. They have to be worker farmer. This is the difference between these two sultans and the way they planned and prepared or strategized to fight the Mongol invasion. Now comes the Sayyid and Lodi dynasties. Now we have seen after the Kaljis and Tughlaqs, we have Sayyids and Lodis. 14 to, 14 to 51 and 51 to 26, we have the Sayyids and Lodis. What they did? They ruled from Delhi and Agra until 1526. Bengal, Malwa, Gujarat, Rajasthan, entire South India also had 
independent rulers bengal malwa gujarat rajasthan south india so the western side the eastern side the southern side all of them had independent rulers who had established the flourishing states and prosperous capitals that means what the smaller kingdoms were richer better managed and well ruled by able rulers so the sultanate could not annex them and make them part of the empire but since the said the noni dynasties were having a larger empire because consolidation and expansion happened during this period and it was handed over to them then came sharsha suri sharsha suri is a famous king 1540 to 1545 he was a manager of a small territory for his uncle in bihar but eventually he challenged and defeated the mogul empire humayun in 1530 to 40 and 55 to 56 during this 10 years and this 5 years and introduced an efficient administration sharsha suri when he took over the sultanate of delhi after defeating emperor humayun the emperor sharsha suri introduced lots of efficient administrative rules in the delhi sultanate so he was a very able ruler but he started as a manager of a small territory then came akbar what we today call as akbar the great he ruled between 56 and 1605 he lived between 56 and 1605 so akbar's life was about 50 60 years from an young age itself he had to take over the responsibility of ruling the kingdom he consolidated the mogul empire and he followed the model implemented by sher shah suri the good thing of about akbar is akbar was considered to be more kind than the predecessor sultans of delhi sultanate now what happened during this in other parts of the world now there is something called three orders or three classes what is that those who prayed those who fought and those who till the land those who till the land are the peasants those who fought are the soldiers the church wanted to propagate christianity the church also wanted to ensure that the three classes remained as three and remained under their control so what they did the church said spread the idea of peace of god the church said spread the idea of peace of god to whom they told this to the people who fought by saying what don't fight with one another one another but go and fight with others who are not part of the church so the church wanted to propagate the idea of peace of god they directed the warriors on a campaign against muslims who had captured the city of jerusalem thought it turned away warriors from the conflict among themselves so the church thought one way to make the people who fought not to fight among themselves not to have conflict among themselves is to send them on the idea of peace of god to go and fight with muslims why they had to fight with muslims because they believed muslims took away jerusalem what is jerusalem jerusalem is a cradle of the islam and muslim faith so because the muslims took away jerusalem it has to be fought and taken back and for that the church encouraged the people who fought the warriors to go and fight with the muslims so that they will be very busy fighting and they will not time to fight among themselves and when they don't fight among themselves the control of the church on those kingdoms will remain for longer period that was one of the game plans happening in other part of the world now this fight by these people we can call them as knights because ultimately they became knights by those who fought against the muslims did not happen in one day or one year it happened hundreds of times so it is called series of campaigns called crusades what is it called it is a series of campaigns called crusades and it is in the service of god why the church said you are going to spread the idea of peace of god you are going to spread the idea of peace of god and you are not fighting among yourself so this series of campaigns called crusades in service of god and church completely altered the status of the knights so the knights were earlier called only the warrior knights the knights were only called the warrior knights but later they became more popular more powerful and they became by the end of 12th century knights the capital knights is a nobility the small k knights will be what we can say as normal fighters so when the people who fought one of the classes on the advice of the church went on a series of campaigns called crusades against the fight against the muslim army or muslims to get back jerusalem these campaigns altered their status and they became called as knights with more nobility and more powers and more status and more titles 
This was what was happening on other part of the world when Delhi was ruled by Delhi Sultans. Thanks for watching this video. Please keep come back for more such sessions.